Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a special edition show. I'm here with Michelle Ross of Soder uh, Vineyard. Yeah, Soder, is it Vineyards or mm -hmm, Vineyard? Okay, mm -hmm, vineyard. sometimes it's a state, <laughs> sometimes it's something, but, um, and uh, so we just uh, went through the vineyard and uh, I took some amazing drone footage, or at least it looked amazing on the phone. <laughs> um, I'm sure it is amazing. Uh, we talked about a lot of the, the history and all that, but before I, before I go any farther, uh, Michelle, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and kind of sure. how did you get to here? Sure. Um, so my background is restaurants and distribution and retail and originally moved out to Oregon for uh, the viticulture and enology program at Oregon State University. Uh, it's located in Corvallis, which is a little bit remote. So my husband and I moved right back to Portland and sort of um, got our, our feet underneath us and uh, went back into restaurants and uh, met the Soder's Wine in a, a wine program that I worked at. And um, when an opportunity came to work at the winery, it was a no-brainer. So okay. came out here five years ago now. Nice. Yeah. And uh, uh, we discussed you have no plans to become a winemaker, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. Hey, no worries about that, <laughs> Sales right? Sales and hospitality. Hey, you know, <laughs> find, find, find your niche and, and go for it. Um, so kind of talk about the history of Soder and um, uh, how this all came about. Sure. So Tony Soder was born and raised in Portland and mm -hmm. cut his teeth down in Napa in the 70s and 80s. Um, he graduated with a philosophy degree back in 75 and took a harvest internship with Stag's Leap, uh, fully intended to become a lawyer, but got bit by the wine bug and changed his career plans and okay. uh, went on to study winemaking independently for about three and a half years. Finally did get a full-time winemaking position and then uh, went on to be the assistant winemaker at a great producer called Chapelet. Um, and in Never 1980, no, no, yeah. they're awesome. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then established Etude Winery in Carneros in 1980, and um, was the first winemaker at Spotswood in 1982. Um, so met his wife while um, working down there, and they moved back in uh, back to Oregon in 1997. Okay, really to start a family, but also compelled by Pinot Noir up here. All right. Yeah. So is that when this was found in 97? Or, or uh, actually, they purchased a small vineyard north of us called Beacon Hill, but always had their eyes set on this site. This was a century old dairy and cattle ranch. So this became available in um, 2000 and Tony will tell you this is the house that Etude built. He sold Etude to buy this. Um, the vines went in in 2001 and again in 2005. The lodge and the buildings were completed in 2007. Okay and for the purposes right before we started for the purposes of people that are coming here they're going to see a sign that says MSR yes. on the road. So what does MSR stand for? Sure, that stands for Mineral Springs Ranch. And that's okay. the name of our estate here. We have 240 acres. And it's one of um, a few projects within the Soder Vineyards portfolio. So okay. all we do is Tony Soder and Soder Vineyards. He's our sole proprietor. But we have a few projects within the portfolio, including Mineral Springs Ranch. OK. And the, the truck out says produce. So is produce one of those things? Uh, yeah, or that's coming from the estate here but the other wine projects we have are our north valley wines um, and then our planet oregon wines. okay yeah. all right oh yeah you do planet oregon Forgot yeah about that. <laughs> um so um kind of talk about uh the philosophy of what you're doing here with the vineyards and all that and just the whole ecosystem you got going on sure here. sure so the site was always um sustainably and organically farmed the soders are uh, have always been very passionate about that but um with nadine basil who's our vineyard and ranch manager we were able to um, take the site into certified biodynamically farmed um, okay. so we achieved our certification in 2016 and the acreage of the properties devoted to a few different 
programs that make up the biodynamic farming. Uh, there's 30 acres on the front of the property planted to wild green for a dairy farmer a few miles from us. Okay. We don't currently raise dairy cattle and we need access to dairy manure for our compost program and our vineyard preps. So we um, trade the grain that we grow for the cows uh, and then we get the back end of the deal okay. <laughs> and use that in the vineyard. Ba -dum, ba -dum. <laughs> Yeah. You were laughing because you, you knew that. It it's took a me a cheesy second. joke that usually does pretty well for me. <laughs> um, and But you also have some Scottish... Yeah, then uh, there's um, uh, uh, produce and animals that we raise on mm -hmm. site. The main farm is at the base of the property on the back, and there's about okay. two acres total down there. But currently we have 10 head Scottish Highland cattle. Okay. We've got 22 Norwegian pygmy goats, alpacas, donkeys, sheep, ducks, chickens, hogs, you name it. All right, yeah. <laughs> So um, while you, she was describing all this, because we went up to the vineyard, so it's probably my cue to probably start showing the vineyard footage. So on the top where we started, where what's what's all that up there? Sure. So the acreage under Vine, um, total we have about 40 acres. Mm -hmm. There's roughly five acres of Chardonnay just for our sparkling program, mm -hmm. and then about 32 acres of Pinot Noir. Okay. Um, so up at the top, you're seeing all of our, uh, our, our grapes. Um, and it's pretty fun how the vineyards are planted. We have northern, eastern, southern, and western facing vineyards. Uh, the sun comes right over the top and blankets the whole property in okay. beautiful sunlight yeah so I the, so the drone we started up top and I went towards uh, that green patch mm -hmm. uh, and then I kind of circled around I think there was an area of that was where the hogs were the, and yep. there was like clearing now some of this is gonna get cut out like okay. just to make it looks I mean not this the, okay. the drone footage <laughs> some of it's gonna be like not all of it because I stopped and started so to make it look pretty and smooth um, but yeah, there was like that little clearing patch so that I guess that the hogs kind of hang out there. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was like trees and all that. So there's, those are also some habitats for some of the species on, on property. To exactly. Help with the and um, wood uh, thrushes where the, you know, encourages water drainage okay. and how the wind comes across the property. Um, you know, thinking about all these different elements when, when you're planting a vineyard, it really um, encourages the na natural ecology and uh, helps with what we're right. trying to do in the vines. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you also have so you have a state fruit, and then you have some stuff that you get from other people. But they're all they all need to at least follow some type of sustainability. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so our North Valley Vineyard wines, which he created in two thousand three, uh, as a way to highlight the geological and geographical area uh, and the diversity there, but um, also uh, as a way to, to um, you know go beyond what we have on the estate. And those vineyards are all sustainably farmed. They're all certified through what's called Live. So it stands mm -hmm. for low input viticulture and analogy and if we find a vineyard that we'd like to partner with that doesn't already have that certification we'll actually pay for it out of our own pocket and help the farmers obtain that so leave it better than you found it yeah and that's that i think that's absolutely amazing that the, you are going to pay for someone to do that uh i'm not saying that someone's going to hang out and be like well maybe the sodas will come by and like my stuff and pay for it but <laughs> you know if you're interested enough in that vineyard and you want to make this you know have sustainable i think that's i think it's very admirable that you're that you're doing yeah, that so making them go through it exactly i think it's indicative of our region here and it's about the integrity of oregon winemaking across the board right how we're making wine across the state for the next hundred years not just one vineyard for the current year so um ships rising to the tide together and everyone yeah. benefits and um that way um you know we believe it better than we found it right um it just seems to happen i mean i didn't necessarily intentionally uh from at least for the interviews seek out everybody that's doing something like that but it mm -hmm. feels like a lot of people are doing that is that is mm -hmm. that kind of a trend is there is there something like i know like sonoma is trying to be 100 percent sustainable by i forgot what year actually i think it was like this year or mm -hmm. a couple years is oregon or willamette valley is there is there like this concerted effort or it just seems like everyone's just kind of moving towards something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure as far as the Willamette Valley Wine Association or yeah. you know something that's actually on paper for what we're trying to achieve as a region, but certainly the attitude out here, um, it's a belief system that's been instilled in us from the founding families that okay. came with nothing and made wine at night and worked during the day that um, you know we're stewards of the land out here. And um, with the geological history, it's so vast and we are very proud of what we know. We have so much for to go right so it's about um, maintaining like we said the integrity of, of the land and what we're doing in the process right um, we have the strictest labeling laws in the country here in Oregon yeah um, and so you see it as a growing trend that if people can farm in a better way they're certainly uh, looking to 
Yeah, it's and uh, I'm trying. To, I'm going to try to remember these things. Uh, if it if it says Oregon, does it have to be 100 percent from or, all of it have from Oregon, or is it 95? 95. 95. Percent. Yeah. But we are looking at, and there are conversations currently happening about um, maybe demanding 100 percent if it's coming from uh, the Willamette Valley. Okay, and I mean that I. I think a lot of people just assume that's what happens. Um, the TTB is the baseline, is like the, the minimum, and it's 75%. Well, I think it's 85% for an AVA, uh, 75% for like county, state, or county or state, or yeah, county, state, or country. It's kind of weird on the countryside. And then 85% for AVA, and then it's and then it's 95% for single vineyard. That's just TTB. Mm-hmm. But Oregon going above and beyond that for for AVAs and things like that, it's admirable because I think you just you just assume as a consumer that if it says Willamette Valley, sure. or if it says AOL Amity Hills or whatever, that it, all of it came from there. And not exactly. that it's necessarily bad if it didn't, but no, like, just say, a like, further definition yeah. of what it is that we're trying to do and really identifying um, the origin of, yeah. of where the wine's coming from. Because even states like Texas, um, we don't grow enough, and, and there's there's plenty of people that argue this point, that we don't grow enough grapes to supply all of the current production. Mm-hmm. Um, and we definitely don't grow enough grapes at the right price point to support something that's in that 10, 12, or under price point that all wineries can access. Mm-hmm. So yes, we import a lot of California fruit because mm-hmm. it's just, they have way too much. But Oregon doesn't seem to be in that situation. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're part of the big four. So the big four don't have any, it, they don't need to really import grapes from outside of their state. Just maybe sure. if you have a Willamette Valley, you maybe are getting it from, I don't know why you get from Rogue, but maybe you get it from another area of Oregon. Yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of Syrah comes from Washington. Yeah, so. exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, at that point, let's just call it a red blend and mm-hmm. um, as opposed to defining Pinot Noir. Right. Yeah. All right, um, and then, um, so we talked about, we talked about the farming, um, you have so kind of talk about the sparkling wine program. What do you what do you do with that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, it's a fun story. Back in 1997, when the Soders had Beacon Hill, there was some old vine Chardonnay on the site, and at the time, Tony didn't make uh, still Chardonnay. So said to his wife, "What should I do with this?" And she said, "You should make my favorite wine, which is a Brut Rosé." So we lovingly know it on staff as Soder Pop. <laughs> we drink oh it God. like soda pop. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, so it's all done in the traditional method of champagne, which is about a four-year process in total and it's all estate fruit as well all done here on site Um, and I think the most um, special element of the process is we hand riddle all of the bottles and so our production is about 1200 cases that we hand riddle yeah. So it's it, it's still a lot, but it's not like you're doing that. You, your actual case production is not very big anyway. No, on the property here, um, we'll make about 3,000 cases of okay. Pinot Noir, um, maybe 1,200 cases or so of, of the Brut Rosé. Okay. And you... Um, you definitely have some distribution out there. You said that it's mostly mostly on premise. Mm-hmm, exactly. With uh, how highly allocated the estate wines are, mm-hmm. um, you typically find them uh, more readily available at high end restaurants. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I was going to go somewhere with this. I don't remember. What, oh, just about the riddling. Um, yeah, it's not like small. I mean, it's small. <laughs> but and that's still a lot of bottles to hand riddle. Yeah, but it's not like, like you're 6, doing bottles. It's not like you're doing twenty thousand <laughs> cases. And you need like Euro Palace and stuff like that. Right. Um, and then uh, uh, I was just gonna make a comment that I, yesterday over at Left Coast, I got to see a, a tiny production on. That's like mm-hmm. a ten year thing they're doing, um, and they have like the riddling racks, and there's like yeah. kind of like it was ten cases I guess total in there. Mm-hmm. It was very small, but it was interesting. I'd never seen. An actual like regular riddling rack. They're really um, cool. But yeah, it was it was cool to see that. Nice. Um, so yeah, shall we kind of maybe get into start start doing the wines here real quick? Sure, and we absolutely. Can keep talking. Yeah. So what we have here for the lineup? So currently on the flight, well, um, I greeted you with our 2018 North Valley Rosé, and okay. that is from 100% Pinot Noir. Uh, we make rosé intentionally. <laughs> right. Like to oh tell yeah, I left that. that. I left that up there. No, that's okay. I'll drink um, that later. So. It's, yeah, funny story. So, so Michelle walks out, and do you, do you say you like to greet people? Is it before exactly? You walk it's in, our right? signature move. Get you started the right way, but we will meet you in the parking lot with a glass of wine. We don't believe in waiting for you to come to us. We will come to you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm walking in with my equipment. She walks out, has a big smile on her face, and she's handing me the wine. And I'm like, I have to decline it right now because <laughs> I'm going to fly a drone. And 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 I think by now everybody in, uh, who's seen the interviews know that. 
you can't drink and then fly. Mm -hmm. You just can't. But yeah, so I had to unfortunately decline that. But I'll try to remember <laughs> to at least at least drink that later. Um, so yeah, so you start with with rosé, mm -hmm. and then um, we're basically going to kind of replicate what would normally happen sure. for a tasting. So um, so yeah, you have to have an appointment. Yeah, yes. kind of go through that, and then we can sure. kind of go into the lines. Yeah, we're open seven days a week, mm -hmm. and we offer what we call our uh, classic tasting uh, seven days a week, three times a day. It's about 45 minutes to an hour long where one of our uh, hospitality leads will sit with you and guide you and your guests through the, our flight of wines, telling you more about how the wines were made, um, our farming practices, and Tony's career history. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a great way to take the wines out for a test drive and let them evolve in the glass. And you connect with the space and the people uh, on staff as well yeah um, but you're tasting from two projects within the soda vineyards um, portfolio the North Valley wines and then the estate wines coming from Mineral Springs Ranch okay. so the next wine up is the 2017 North Valley Reserve right. Chardonnay you can grab a glass, yeah, a glass here right there. yeah and uh, reserve is a funny word in the wine industry because there's no legal yeah. definition exactly. <laughs> as what it has not to here. mean yeah. not here in other places you know it does mean things either it's aging or alcohol or something like mm -hmm. that there's something about it but yeah in the united states i could say it's reserved because i felt like it exactly charge you like five more bucks for the bottle <laughs> but yeah so but and in this case i'm sure it actually means something yeah yes. we use the term to provide the wine with a level of distinction because we don't necessarily produce and bottle a reserve uh, wine every vintage whereas we do make what we call our classic chardonnay and classic pinot noir every year okay. just a textbook example of a regional blend but the reserve is limited to only the best fruits available in our vineyard partnerships so this wine was about 450 cases in production okay. uh, it's not a wine that it was um, nationally distributed, but was uh, sent to our wine club and is available here in our tasting room. Okay. So on the wine, first of all, the wines really taste good. <laughs> Before I, because sometimes I just get, I want to get geeked out. So I'm tasting the wine and I'm, I'm thinking about it, but then I kind of get geeked out on like wine making process. Um, so let me just kind of talk about the wine first. Sure. Um, it's really nice uh it's clean it's not um if there's oak it's not a lot mm -hmm. um that's what that's what was going to prop me to like we'll talk about the winemaking process um i would imagine there's there's a touch of oak to it but not a lot of new oak um if the, and, and if it's no oak then that's less well, pretty cool too <laughs> sure. but um i like i like where it's coming from um it's really got some good fruit to it um it's not ripping acidity but it's, it's got enough acidity to kind of balance everything i mean my mouth is watering but it's not like we're not talking chablis here mm -hmm. um but um yeah so kind of walk me through the process of what they're doing uh, down the winery on this sure sure um so we say we're inspired by white burgundy and mm -hmm. specifically chablis but it's oregonian chardonnay yeah. uh, and with a cool climate chardonnay it exhibits a more austere flavor profile mm -hmm. you're seeing more citrus and apple yeah uh, and so the wine doesn't benefit from a heavy hand in the cellar so we are using just a little bit of new French oak in the barrel program but the most uh, the majority of the wine is uh, aged in stainless steel and neutral barrels or barrels okay. that have been previously filled and then for the malolactic fermentation or what imparts that creamy texture uh, we don't let a, a lot of uh, malolactic fermentation take place in the wine so um, I think Tony would tell you just a little bit of that creamy texture and a little bit of that baking spice and roundness that yeah. you get from the oak rounds the edges on the wine but at the core we're looking to maintain the beautiful backbone of acidity in the wine it's lithe and crisp more um sort of linear and taut yeah. in that way kind of quenches your thirst but begs another sip so in, in in the chablis realm um so when we do our when we do our tastings we pretty much are going to do probably premier cru at, at the highest mm -hmm. because premier cru stays to the whole tradition of stainless steel or concrete and if it is wood it's neutral mm -hmm. but when you get to the grand cru's then you can have, and it's not like 100% French, new French oak, but you can get some oak expressions. So this is, I would say, closer to that, where you're getting some oak influence, but it's not like a lot. Um, and I, I think you know, how you described it, that there's a roundness to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fullness of the fruit. Um, there's even a touch of peach to this, in, in addition to the apple. Um, and the fact that it doesn't go through a lot of mallow, it allows you to retain some of the, 
some of that apple quality, but then they get that creaminess. So mm -hmm. um, is there a lot of lees stirring on this or is it just kind of rest on the lees? Exactly. It just stays on the lees. Okay. Um, we really don't stir much, much batonage um, if the wine calls for if we're looking to generate just a little bit of richness. But okay. otherwise, um, just keeping it really, really hands off and really clean and bright. Uh, but I love it. I think a lot of guests that come here to the tasting room are very hesitant to drink Chardonnay, sort of pigeonhole the varietal as this unctuous tropical wine. Right. And it's a lot of fun to talk about what a malleable varietal it is, uh, what our cool climate influence can do. Uh, people might blind this for something like a Sauvignon Blanc or um, you know Pinot Gris. So it's fun that many guests leave saying, I can finally drink Chardonnay again. Yeah, so this is <laughs> a lot closer to what I like in Chardonnay. I don't like the, okay, so every every interview I say the same thing. There's a time and a place for every style of wine. Mm -hmm. So if you want the super oaky butter bomb, that's awesome, and you should drink it, absolutely. Yeah. That's not my preferred style. Um, but occasionally I'm kind of like, all right, fine, I'm going to drink that because I'm going to enjoy it. This is much closer to what, there's, I, I like the white burgundy side of things and the Chablis mm -hmm. side of things, um, and... Having gone there, I, I kind of get it a little mm -hmm. bit more, why people get all nutsy cuckoo about white burgundy. Um, but I've always been, obviously nutsy cuckoo, but I've always been like a fan <laughs> of, Sh of the Chablis, the really austere, steely, flinty, really higher acid stuff. Mm -hmm. But then when I got to burgundy and I got something closer to this, I was like, okay, there's an elegance to it, not mm -hmm. just this, it's hitting your face with butter and oak. Right. You know, so and I white like burgundies yeah. are fairly expensive. You know, mm -hmm. you have to pay to play. So being able to capture familiarity and similarity with a domestic Chardonnay yeah. um, is is rare, I think, and uh, it's nice to be able to offer a more affordable wine. Yeah. So what does this uh, uh, typically run? Sure. This retails at fifty five a bottle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's still, it, it you know, trust me, I. I get it, it's 55 bucks, mm -hmm. but it's excellent quality. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good bottle right there. Well, and um, you know, for what I call my Friday night wine, we do the North Valley Classic Chardonnay. Yeah. Uh, it is similar in style, just a little bit of, of new oak in the program, much a uh, little bit less than this. And um, that steam approach. So if you like this, you'll in, in definitely yeah. like that. And that retails at 30 a bottle. Yeah, yeah that's totally cool too, yeah. Even at 55, it's absolutely worth it. Um, it's not, I, I don't think it's expensive for what you were, you know, I don't think it's an expensive sure. bottle of wine as far as what you're getting out of mm -hmm. it, you know, so. And but suitable yeah. to age, too, if you wanted yeah, to yeah. lay it down. I know aging white wine, people sort of think, oh, goodness, you can age white wine. But um, these white wines are, are definitely made to stand up to a little bit of age if you'd like to do it. Uh, and so we're drinking the 2014 currently, and it was a similar oh, yeah, uh, nice. vintage to the 17, what you have here. Yeah. So I would imagine this wine would do very well with uh, maybe three more years on it. Yeah, uh, trust me. Uh, uh, so in a couple days, I'm going to be visiting... Resonance, mm -hmm. resonance. Um, we had a little cross. We had a little like communication. I thought I was supposed to visit them, whatever day it was, and they didn't realize I was coming, or, oh. the, or Guillaume didn't realize I was coming. So we rescheduled for a different day next week. And um, but they're. I'm not trying to like hijack the interview here, but they're, <laughs> they're so they're a Jadot project. So yeah. I went to Burgundy, went to Jadot, and I told them that I had a 2000 half bottle, 2000 Chasson Montrachet Chez from them. It was a premier crew of that. And, and that was amazing. So an, an, I drank it, what, last year? So an 18-year-old bottle of wine that was a half bottle that would be effectively at least a 20 to 22-year aging process because half bottles, you know, they, they age faster. It was delicious. So, yeah. yes, the bottom line is you can – it's not because it was burgundy, but you can definitely age white wine. Mm -hmm. And I've mm -hmm. had some really cool older white wines from the United States and from Europe, and, yeah, you can totally do it. Yeah. If they're yeah. well if they're well made you can do it it looks like I'm a little washed out so I'm gonna get up while we're keep going okay okay and I'm going to um, kind of adjust things okay so you can keep talking and uh, I'm gonna pour the next wine sure so, uh, everybody knows that this is something that I occasionally do I just get up okay great <laughs> the next wine is a bit of a unicorn for us this is our 2017 Savannah Ridge origin Pinot Noir I was basically your first having to do this. Um, well, actually, it's not. I, at at Don Hoff, I kept stopping because she kept bringing out, like, I don't know how many wines you did, but we did a lot of wines that day. <laughs> um, but uh, so sorry about that. Um, using a different, using the Moment app because the other app, um, 
this is probably a good time to, to – I'm sorry. Good time to mention You're this. Fine. Filmic Pro contacted me about the issue that I was having with them in the, in the, um, in the uh, remote. And um, basically they know about it and they're trying to fix it. Hopefully by the time you see this episode, that's fixed. But unfortunately, I need it now <laughs> to work the way I want it to, not three weeks from now. So, um, so yeah, it just – the things were getting really washed out from what I could tell. And I wanted to at least make – like a little better quality so i have it on automatic so sorry michelle to oh, uh, okay. interrupt um i think you were you were talking about the story so yeah onto um, the pinos yeah so it was onto the pino so this is origin we're yeah doing right this here? is our okay. 2017 savannah ridge origin okay. uh, pinot noir and in our origin series those are pinot noirs devoted to the geological and geographical uh, identity of the wine, right? The origin. Mm -hmm. So Savannah Ridge is the name of the ridge line that our estate, Mineral Springs Ranch, is situated upon. Okay. So we share the Savannah Ridge line with a few other neighboring vineyards, including Abbott Clean. And the vineyard, uh, the vineyards in this bottling, about 70% of the fruit is from Mineral Springs Ranch. The remaining is from Abbott Clean, which is a neighboring site on the other side of our ridge line. Uh, it's a well-known vineyard. Um, great winemaker Ken Wright has bottled Abbott claims specific Pinot Noirs before yeah. uh, but fun to highlight this and it's a bit of a unicorn wine uh, in the sense that we've never bottled this in previous vintages and I'm not sure we will have the opportunity going forward um, basically 2017 was the vintage that just kept giving and we had more juice than we expected coming out of the the vineyard so the grapes actually swelling to produce more than we anticipated in our measurements so with that we made a new wine and only about 700 cases of this were made so it did go to our wine club members okay. but this is a wine that is also not available out in distribution or in the national market and this is like silky smooth <laughs> um i mean i think silk is a really good way to put this i don't use that term a lot with wines i'll just say they're smooth and they are i'm not trying to like not say they're smooth if i say it's smooth it's smooth uh, <laughs> well to me it is sure but um there's a little more silkiness to it um i kind of equate this to um i know it's a completely different grape but so when you're tasting wines, or when I taste wines, some, uh, when you're like having that cab versus Merlot thing, Merlot mm -hmm. tends to have that silkier quality. Um, so this doesn't taste like Merlot, but there's <laughs> that, there's that silkiness to it that I don't always get from Pinot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like Pinot in, in many incarnations of how it is. Oregon Pinot is absolutely my best, which I don't know if I mentioned that already. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, they all know that, but I like to let <laughs> the people that I'm with know that Oregon is my favorite expression of Pinot. We love that. <laughs> no offense to the Burgundians, and you guys were awesome, and I loved all the wines I had out there. <laughs> but, and I was actually up front with them that I still like Oregon better. I mean, <laughs> as, a, as a category. Um, but, um, but a lot of times with, with Pinot as a category, um, I don't get as much silkiness out of it. I may get some elegance, and to me, there's there's a difference between those two. Um, but yeah, this is like just like it's like it's just smooth and just elegant awesome. and elegant and just silky. So I like it a lot. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. We've had a string of beautiful, warm vintages. Um, they've been easy to, to farm in the vineyards and really opulent wines, sort of these hedonistic, um, big, rich pinots. I think that's what it is. There's a bit of hedonism to it. Um, and I know that big and rich are typically not words you use with pinot. So let's be clear. This is not in the style of some Pinots that you can get from California that are like, they look like Cab and they look like a Merlot. <laughs> that have Syrah blended in. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that, did I? Or Petite Syrah? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, which, you know, a little a little bit of that goes a long way. Um, I mean, seriously, you only need like a, it's just a very, very small amount of Petite Syrah to add a lot of color to something. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this is, but there's, it's still Pinot. It still has all the characteristics of a Pinot Noir. Um, it's still got the right color. It's still got all that stuff. It's just, yeah, just a little more richness to it. And I think that's where it adds to the silkiness to it. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's definitely more fruit forward. Um, I tend to like it a little more earthy, but, but I like I like the balance of earth mm -hmm. and fruit. Sure. But this is delicious, and I 
totally could just yeah that's awesome yeah, yeah it's fun we celebrate vintage variation uh certainly yes. so with these warm years anyone that finds pinot noir to be a little bit light in body and a little bit lower in alcohol than what they're looking for um i i can ten, turn you towards a warmer year and you'll have a little more meat on the bones yeah. and then with the geological and geographical diversity depending on where the fruit's coming from uh, sometimes the fruit has a little bit more structure as well um, and those bolder characteristics um, yeah. Or if you like burgundy wines and um, something that's a little bit more nuanced, we can look at colder years that have some of that uh, more subtlety uh, available. And that's one of the things I like about Oregon. Uh, again, this is not the knock on California as a whole because I like a lot of California wines uh, from all different areas. But California, and I got to be careful how I say this because right now there's a bunch of fires going on, so I don't want to be disrespectful. Sure. But in agricultural wise and climate wise, and there's drought and all that, but as far as like a year to year to year, it's fairly similar. I don't want to use the word spoiled necessarily, but it's uh, the whole state just has like almost perfect weather. Now, granted, fires are not great um, and all those stuff that's going on, but um, you can get a sameness from year to year to year. And then when they get that one year that is like a challenge, then it's like, oh, and then people, and then what sucks is that people kind of don't recognize there's, a, there's actually a variation, a significant variation in vintage, and they just kind of complain, well, it doesn't taste like, you know, the previous year or the, or the year after. I'm like, mm -hmm. you should be celebrating the fact that there was a, a difference significant enough that the wine's going to taste different. Mm -hmm. Oregon doesn't have, doesn't have that type of, they're not as spoiled. You don't have, <laughs> like, the perfect weather almost every single day. Um, if a far as for agriculture, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't. So I like vintage variation. I think it's wonderful, and I think wine should express that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you could be a winemaker and completely manipulate it if you want to, and that's fine. You know, that, that, I'm not going to sure. fault you for it. But yeah, the fact that vintage variation exists in Oregon a little more than say other parts of the country or the world. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful to at least celebrate that. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's Tony Soder's approach that uh, we hope that you leave with a sense of place in mm -hmm. the wines, you know, where the fruit is coming from and a little bit of what was going on that year. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, wonderful wine. So what does that uh, normally go for uh, up here? Sure. So that retails at 60 a bottle. Okay. Yeah, totally cool. Yeah. That's great, and so that go that went to um, the wine club members. But if somebody came up here and wanted, it to get is a available. Bottle, yeah, in the tasting, tasting room, room. Okay. you just wouldn't find it uh, distributed at Got restaurants it. or retail. Okay. Um, yeah. Across. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's move on to sure. the next wine. Great. Well, we're going to come to the estate with this next okay. bottling. This is our flagship wine. It's our 2016 Mineral Springs Ranch, and that's okay. the name of the estate vineyard here. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I think this green label is certainly um, what people would most see out in, in the marketplace um, okay. with our namesake. And this is a blend of the five types or clones of Pinot Noir that we have planted within the 32 acres devoted to Pinot Noir. Okay, yeah, we didn't talk about that earlier. So mm -hmm. which ones are you using? Sure. So we have Vadensville and Pomard, like to call them the original gangsters, <laughs> and then Dijon 114 and 115. And the last is our heirloom. Um, and it's quite a romantic story. It's a clipping of heirloom fruit that Tony Soder worked with down in Carneros. Uh, it's what he enjoyed the most. So he took a clipping of that and propagated it at the crown of the vineyard it needs the most sunlight being that it originated from California but uh, being that it was a clipping or derivative of whatever it was originally and then how it's adapted to our property essentially it's completely unique and you wouldn't find that Pinot Noir anywhere else in the world okay. so out of the 32 acres devoted to uh, the heirloom uh, or uh, Pinot Noir 14 acres are solely the heirloom oh wow products. cool so um you, you guys might have been noticing that there's a trend in Oregon that there's this Vadensville uh, clone mm -hmm. that's like, I, I, I'd never, I can't think of ever hearing about it so I got here. <laughs> so either going to the websites or hanging out with people like you mm -hmm. and I go, what clone are you using? And I hear, Vadensville, Vadensville. And I'm like, wow, so that's a uh, German Swiss clone or something like mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. If I remember somebody, Swiss, somebody yeah. else, yeah. Exactly, a suitcase it clone. <laughs> just like everything carried over. <laughs> right. uh, but it's nice. You get some of the structure from Pomard. You get some of the floral fruitiness from the Vadensville. So yeah. just um, increasing the number of paint colors on your palette, per se. Absolutely, yeah. 
So yeah, I've had other people talk about how you know using all these different clones allows you to layer things. Exactly. Um, and I kind of equate it as being a chef and have all the ingredients. So you make you make a dish, and if you don't include something, it's not that the dish is bad; it's just different. Sure. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, um, as far as like my absolute preference of Oregon wines, is a lot closer to what I like. I mean, this is like yeah, this is really that good marriage of old and new world, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I like Oregon wines. Um, it's definitely smooth. It's got some great fruit to it. It's got some really good acidity. My mouth is actually still watering, um, and I haven't had anything for what a couple minutes. So um, I like I like that. I'm an kind of an acid head when mm -hmm. it comes to wine. I think so, it's a product of the industry. The longer you you know you create yeah. the beautiful acidity. <laughs> like when you drink like Brut Natur champagne, you're mm -hmm. just like. Yes. <laughs> and then other people are kind of like, dude, it has no sugar in it. Like, yeah, that's the big great thing about it. Or really racy. maybe two yeah. grams. And then they drink. It's like, oh, it's too sharp. It's too, I want brute. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe it or not, only a couple more grams of sugar really makes a difference. But, yeah, this is this is really great. I like the, the aromas on it. There's definitely more earthiness to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should say we're located in Yamhill Carlton. Uh, it's one of the seven AVAs or viticultural areas that make up the northern Willamette Valley. Um, that's just the top third from, from Portland down to Salem. But yeah. Yamhill Carlton is sort of this upside down horseshoe known for ancient okay. marine sedimentary soils. Yeah. And um, here with those soils, they're very poor soils. So we get a lot of drainage, but you get a bolder, spicier fruit profile, um, beautiful sort of dusty tannins. Um, if if you ever hear about the Rutherford dust, sort of right, a chalky yeah. tannin. Uh, and there's something sort of meaty and sappy to the wine. Uh, reminds me of like Gevry Chambertin or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Gevry is kind of one of my favorite, uh, Bur I'm saying Bordeaux, Burgundies. <laughs> um, I, I just, I just kind of like, I guess the, the Cote de Nuit is, is there's the quote more masculine. Mm -hmm. uh, they just have, they tend to have more power to them, but like Jeffrey Charmerton tends to have that extra little bit of power. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of the burgundies I do like. Um, but it doesn't mean I won't like anything from the the Cote de Bone or or elsewhere. Uh, well, basically Cote de Bone and Cote de Nuit. I mean, you can have Pinots, other areas of Burgundy, but. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean I won't enjoy it, but I, I definitely will. But I kind of like that extra little bit of power that, that Jerry Chamberton brings. Sure. Yeah. And it's fun when you get into the minutia of all the different viticultural areas out here and the geographical influences. There's a wine for everyone. You know, you were um, with Sokol Blosser over in Dundee. Those yeah. wines are lifted and fruit forward. Um, I think of Left Coast and the Van Duzer Corridor there as um, darker bramble berry and, and more structure. So um, depending on what you feel like drinking, there's something for every occasion <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact okay so again not to like talk about the other places but i had a oh, we love that <laughs> well um so it wasn't even a tasting appointment but uh will over at left coast said you should need to go to Bryn Mawr. so i went to Bryn Mawr, and you can see the van duzer corridor from the top of their hill so exactly. um this is a beautiful property you should come here but um since i didn't do an interview at Bryn Mawr, i'll give them like a little bit of a prop definitely visit them um, and they have an incredible view, and I hope to go back there at some point in time and take the drone, because um, I couldn't do it yesterday because I had already wine, so I couldn't yeah. do the drone. <laughs> but um, they have some cool stuff there too. But maybe I'll, well, of course I watched all my interviews, so yeah. that means I probably put the picture that I took of the Van Duzer corridor, so you can actually see what it looks like. I'm, I'm looking over there. Um, you can see what it looks like, um, and it makes kind of sense on how things go. And then I've been to a couple other, and then I went to, um, Christum after that and they nice. talked about how uh, I think it's the Eileen vineyard for them is like the first the first one that gets the mm -hmm. gets the wind that comes in so driving out here and driving all over I don't I'm not going to get to the farthest south part I'm not going to get to like to sure. King Estate and all that so I'm not going to see the entire Willamette Valley but I'm going to see a lot of the central and northern it, it makes a lot of sense to see how the land goes and this is why I make these trips mm -hmm. because it's educational um, that's why going to Burgundy, I get it. Yeah. You know why things are the way they are. You read in a book, that's fine, but I know exactly. why, why they are. Why yeah, they the, are. the topography yeah. is uh, amazing out here and the undulations. And yeah. that's what I like about the spirit of Oregon winemaking is what's going on in each of these wineries can't be replicated or duplicated. They're completely unique. So there's not that stepping on toes. It's um, a sense of collaboration. And um, we couldn't be more excited to tell yeah. you where else to go. So um, it's tough.
tough to visit it all. The whole valley is 150 miles long, 50 miles wide. And a good perspective on things, you could fit four to five Napa valleys in the Willamette Valley. Yeah. So uh, it's vast. And so please come out. Um, we would love it if you uh, included us in your trip out here. But there's so many great places to go and to see what they're doing with what um, sort of characteristics are happening in their vineyards. Yeah. And I've, I've had, you know, I've had people give me suggestions and I, I try to take them up on it, you know, between appointments and all that. So, yeah. Um, so wonderful wine. So awesome. let's we'll go move to on the to heirloom. The last one. Yeah, I'll so leave this, this here because well, sure. Here. Either way, this is our yeah, most we'll special bottle. Okay. Um, so our 2016 Mineral Springs White Label. Okay. And this is our finest estate wine. So um, like I mentioned before, the heirloom vines always got blended into the flagship wine, but. If Mother Nature is so kind, in the most spectacular vintages, we will also bottle the heirloom vines on their own. Okay. And that's what you have in the white label. We've never had the vineyard, uh, the vines tested to find out exactly what type of Pinot Noir they are. We're not really concerned with what it is so much as how it tastes. Okay. So um, if we're able to make this, maybe 500 cases get made. Um, always promise to our wine club allocations, but uh, this is a wine that's very rarely uh, ever distributed outside of, of that. Yeah. <laughs> without without having to put the explicit tag on, um, <laughs> which I can do. I just don't normally. I just don't normally do that. Sure. Um, so there's there's like this extra bit of mintiness to it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's like taking this and just kind of taking it to another level. I mean, obviously it's you know it's all 100% the heirloom, and this is what 60% typically heirloom um I, i'm not sure exactly how the breakdown goes but there's a good amount of heirloom but yeah there, there's there's yeah. definitely it's definitely present in the the blend yeah but this is like you know kind of that single singular expression um i mean i already know that so maybe it's power suggestion but um <laughs> it's i think a little more focused mm -hmm. um and there's that little hint of mintiness for me on it um along with that cherry i mean so cherry is, if you don't get cherry in a Pinot Noir, then there's probably something wrong. Um, <laughs> you probably should get cherry. Um, it's just a matter of what kind of cherry it is, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, it's, but it's like a, it's like a minty cherry, mm -hmm. touch of chocolate to it, but it's like pretty subtle. Sorry. Um, but, um, it is delicious. I'm glad you like it. Thanks. This is a wine I find myself still thinking about 15 minutes after I've yeah. taken a sip and... Um, yeah, this will age easily for another decade, if not longer. 2008 nice. was the very first vintage that we okay. designated uh, a white label or heirloom bottling. And those wines are still so youthful in the center and beautiful uh, preservation of the acidity and the expressive fruit. Um, so feel confident with laying this bottle down. So this is not an every year bottling it's only right. every few years whatever, mm. whatever whatever the vintage presents exactly for instance in 2013 we had six to eight inches of rain hit the valley in two days in the middle mm. of harvest yeah so that is a year that we did not bottle our um reserves our origins or the heirloom we okay. just focused on the core brands and made sure that we can make the best wine possible okay um, yeah, so this is wonderful. So what would this be around here at the winery? Sure, this retails at 100 a bottle. And I, I don't know totally if you said it. it, the estate retails at 75 a okay, bottle. Okay, yeah, we didn't talk about blend. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I totally get 100 bucks <laughs> on this. I totally get it. So, yeah, I mean, these are wonderful wines. Um, and thank I, you. D thank you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's our pleasure. Um, so, and, and this is effectively the type of experience you're going to get. You also have a culinary thing that you can do too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, with the produce and the animals that we raise, uh, we utilize what we grow for what we call our provisions tasting. Yeah. And that's offered Fridays through Mondays. Uh, we can accommodate dietary restrictions and food allergies. And, um, you know, I think a lot of food and wine pairings can be very rigid in their structure, but not the case for us. We want it to be a convivial, casual experiment. What grows together goes together. So we pour a flight of six wines on the table. Um, the food is sourced from what we raise, and the menu changes weekly, if not daily, depending on what the farm is doing and what our chefs are inspired by. Yeah. So you can come through and taste through the seasons with us, um, and it's just a fantastic way to enjoy um, a little food on the side. Okay, that is awesome. So you know, she was telling me about that on the way over here. Oh yeah, we're, 
the house, the little structure we're in. Come yeah. talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. we totally forgot about where we're, where we're at. So, yeah. Sure. So, um, the property was a home for the Soders until 2011. Lived here with their kids. And it's a, basically a, a deconstructed two-bedroom house. Um, our main lodge area uh, where the tasting bar is was the common area. So, their kitchen, what was their dining room, and their living room is in that space. And then there are two little cabins. We're in the west cabin, um, nestled in the hillsides here. And the those were the sleeping quarters, one for the soders and one for their children. Um, and the cabins are pretty autonomous. They have full kitchens and restrooms, so you're not popping up to the lodge every time um, you want a cup of coffee and it's right. raining outside. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a beautiful place to be with Mother Nature all around. So is that with the, the cabin? Is that the other one there? Mm -hmm, okay. Exactly, and they're um, very similar floor plans, but we've taken over now. We've grown into all the different spaces. So we host our classic tastings in the cabin. Um, you can certainly request them if you'd like, mm -hmm. uh, and then our food and wine tastings are closer to where the kitchen is. Where the kitchen is, yeah. And so when I came in, uh, there was all these amazing smells. You say you make your own pastas. What, what kind of go through? Sure, yeah. we make yeah. um, all of our uh, the bread program. So all of the pastas, breads, and crackers in, are made in house. Today we have um, cavatelli pasta with a broccoli oh. pesto and cured egg yolk shaved over the top. <laughs> um, and then all of the charcuterie as well. As well, we raise heritage hogs. Um, ideally, the Scottish Highland cattle will come on for the culinary program in about four years. So we have copa, lonza. Uh, we call it soda shudo, basically prosciutto from the hogs that we raise nice. we're able to do all of our curing and aging on site as well very cool very cool and you know what man the kids had their own spot <laughs> that's cool um i'm an only child so it, i mean mm -hmm. it didn't really matter to me <laughs> that i lived, you know same structure as my parents like you know but yeah yeah that's so you can't, it's like having your own tree house, I guess. Exactly. Honestly, because it's like, in a, I don't know if it was, that was theirs or this one, but it's like being a tree house. Exactly. Honestly, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so um, I think we've kind of covered everything. Awesome. Yeah. Do yeah. um, you have anything else that you want to like mention that maybe we didn't talk about? Um, um, no, you know, I feel I feel good. I was, um, I think I was saying to you, Mark, that, you know, we are uh, certified biodynamically farmed. And um, with the, the food program, I think you can see too that not just what's going on in the vineyards, right? It's a sense of community community and sustainability and uh, just a really special place to be so thank you so much for including us in your trip out here yeah. um, there's so many amazing stories and and wines and we really um, enjoy being a part of, of your trip so well, thank you Michelle thank you so much of course. Um, so spending the time with me and and hanging out and telling me the story that's awesome uh, so folks we're gonna wrap it up uh, you can click the links above you can frame me up I'll have links below about uh, or link I always say links because I don't know, but there'll be a link below to the winery so you can check them out. You can request uh, to come up here for a tasting and um, definitely check the place out. It's beautiful. So that's going to do it. And thank you all for stopping by and we'll see you again next time.